Thank you, everyone, for coming to the talk today. So if you don't mind, we're just going to get started with the talk. So thanks for all coming today. My name is Jonathan. I'm a member of the Socialist Workers' Party. Uh, I've, I'm from South London branch. Uh, I've been involved in lots of campaigns around uh, standing against the far right in South London, particularly, and uh, campaigns around Palestine. Uh, so we're gonna, the meeting will run. It'll be a 30 minute talk uh, by, by Laura here. Uh, and then we will go into little breakouts for two to three minutes, have uh, discussions with the people around you. And then we'll come back for a large group, group, a large group discussion all together at the end. And then uh, there'll be announcements and then Laura will come back on everything that, that has been said. So again, we, the title of the meeting today, What is Imperialism? A Marxist Analysis with Laura Badasco. So, with no further interruption. Right. Thank you, comrades. How fantastic it is to see a lot of people here today, and what a fantastic start to Marxism festivals. Thank you very much for being here, and I hope you have enjoyed the previous sessions. I most certainly did. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for, for chairing. Um, so, I just wanted to start by sort of talking about the context of imperialism today, because if you've come to this meeting, which is called a Marxist understanding of imperialism, it probably sounds like really theoretical to you, right? And in fact, you know, the meeting is grouped as part of the theory meetings. But hopefully what I'm trying to do here and what I hope people take from this meeting is that a theory of imperialism and a Marxist understanding of imperialism is not just the theory, but it is the key to understand the world today and is extremely relevant, not just relevant, but, but crucial to understand the world that we're living in. So we're not just dealing in the abstract right now, we're going to try and keep it very um, sort of grounded in reality and very much, you know, obviously without uh, neglecting the theory, not, not getting lost in just the purely theoretical. So I wanted to start by giving a little bit of context on what imperialism uh, means to people in the world today. And um, I thought it was, it was okay to start with the example of the debate that erupted around the UCU, which is for, for people that might not be following trade union politics, the University and College Union. Um, there was a huge debate that erupted as a result of, of their conference passing an anti-war motion. Now, this shouldn't be really something that is contested. It was an anti-war motion, after all, that was passed by the conference by a majority vote. However, the National Secretary of the Union herself, seeing the, the problems that um, were whipped up or sort of social media in terms of the motion herself, rushed to quickly distance herself in a very undemocratic move, after all, from this motion in particular. Now, what was this motion exactly? Why did it cause this kind of... Um, a broad on different sectors of the trade union movement. Well, this motion in particular, I want to argue, correctly identified the conflict in Ukraine as an anti-imperialist proxy war and expressed um, that the UCU, from that point onwards, would not be supporting NATO intervention or escalation in Ukraine whatsoever. Now, people have already weighed in on why this wasn't the, the case, that it was right to oppose this motion. I'm sure people in the audience will have some things to say about this as well. Uh, but the key argument I want to make here, and I, I hope it starts to emerge, is that our notion of imperialism as Marxists is not the only one, and it's highly contested, and we can see it in examples like this, uh, where we see debates erupting on, on what imperialism means and what imperialism looks like today. So, um, just to go back to the war in Ukraine in particular, which will be maybe more familiar to comrades that are not necessarily British, uh, that is another example that where the war imperialism gets thrown around, people argue that the US is the empire that is sort of trying to intervene in Ukraine, uh, Russia is not imperialistic, other people argue that we're in fact seeing an inter-imperialist uh, proxy war. But the point is, the war imperialism just appears there all the time, and I think we need to take a step back and look at what Marxists have to say about imperialism to ground this debate in sort of a theoretical understanding, not just of the war in Ukraine, the UCU motion, certainly not necessarily the UCU motion, but ideas such as what's happening between the USA and China today. How do we explain that as Marxists? So let's take a step back and, and think about what Marxists have to say about imperialism. So the Marxist theory of imperialism itself came about in the early 20th century and is, as the name suggests, built on the insights of Karl Marx with inputs from um, key revolutionaries such as Vladimir Lenin, uh, Bukharin, Rosa Luxemburg, later on Alex Kalinikos, Tukin Halas, and so on. And um, I'm sorry to report that the context in which this theory came about 
is not very different from the context that we're seeing today, which is another reason why this theory has to the test of time, because after all, it was developed to explain a particular context in history, and that context is still all around us today. That was the context of, of war, and more particularly, what uh, revolutionaries, specifically Lenin, were seeing at the time, was this, this idea that capitalist nation states were fundamentally driven to expand their empires globally and how he could already tell this was to, was to lead to, to war. Um, now, he wrote this and immediately, not exactly immediately, but very soon was vindicated by the fact that the First World War erupted uh, a few years after he formulated this theory. Not only you know, did we see the, the First World War, but we know there was a Second World War. Essentially, ever since I've been alive, uh, since the 2000s, I haven't seen a day that would have been peace in, in the world. So in, in that sense in particular, the theory is already uh, withstanding the test of time in the sense that it explains war, we have not seen an end to war, war has been non-stop, so there is something that we need to look at there. Um, however, I think it's important to look at the context that led to this theory, and comrades will start to realize how this is actually chillingly similar to the situation that we're seeing today. Because uh, when Lenin and Bukharin and then revolutionists at the time were talking about imperialism, it was obvious that the major European powers at the time were arming against each other. They were seeing an arms race, they were seeing military alliances intensify, they were seeing geopolitical competition uh, reach an all-time high, and the rivalries between states were higher than, than they had ever been. Um, how do we explain this development and what happened to get to that point? Well, I want to argue, and this is part of where the theory starts to uh, present its insight, is that at the time, for the first time in history, we were seeing the fusion of, one, on one hand, geopolitical competition, and on the other hand, economic competition. Now, this is nothing new to certainly not everyone in this room, because capitalism, after all, relies on the logic of accumulation and economic competition. But this was the first time in history where um, geopolitical competition and economic competition became one. And therefore, all awful things ensued from, from the mix of, of both. Because for, uh, up until that point, there had been this thing, really, and rooted in different modes of production. On one hand, you had nation states sort of rushing to expand the territories in the colonial projects. And on the other hand, you had the big enterprises, such as the industrial capitalists, who were trying to control their respective sectors of the economy. But for the first time, he noted that we were seeing um, that this two monsters, if you will, were coming together to form a massive mega-monster um, that was going to then subordinate the interests of the nation-state themselves to the interests of the few that were already controlling the economy on one hand and geopolitical competition on the other hand. So this is a very dangerous context that he notes, and he talks about how this intersection, to begin with, sets the ground for imperialism to develop. Now, it is important that we note here that imperialism as a, as a war, it certainly gets thrown around a lot in terms of things that happen in history and some people like to frame it as this is where things went wrong and we could have avoided this if we had been maybe a bit more careful, maybe if European powers hadn't been really, I mean certainly they were already uh, embarked in their bloody colonial projects, but perhaps if they had been content with what they had, we wouldn't have seen the First World War uh, and so on. However, what Lenin crucially argues at this point is that imperialism isn't a flaw in the system, it isn't something that could have been avoided, and it isn't something that wasn't going to happen given the material conditions at the time period. And this is one of the two key things that I hope people take from this, from this sort of meeting, that is that imperialism is not necessarily something that we can get rid of as, as part of capitalism, but it is a stage of capitalism within itself, and this is why the context is so important. We need to understand what made capitalism sort of evolve into the imperialism that we're seeing today. And this is certainly what, what Lenin was trying to explain at the time. Now, this is one of the key points that he makes, the idea that imperialism is a stage, he in fact calls it the highest stage of capitalism um, that happens, as I've said before, when capitalism um, starts to fuse together uh, political and economic accumulation. Um, to explain why they got to that point, because after all, you know, a theory has to be applied to reality to be useful at all. He developed the, this theory a bit, a bit further, and that's where the, the Marxist theory of imperialism came about to be. Um, so if we have the first point that 
um, not to give people too many lists, but I hope you take from this lecture, imperialism is a part of capitalism and we can certainly not make policies against it or sort of try to will it out because we're over imperialism today. The second thing that I think is really crucial to understanding definitely imperialism today, but already imperialism back then, is the idea of what Marxists call an even development. And this is the idea that capitalism isn't spread evenly across the globe. So you'll have nation states that will be very developed in capitalist terms, nation states that are not so much. And on top of that, you will have states that are capitalist, that are really powerful in the current order of things, and other ones that are not as powerful. Now, what is really crucial about this, this is not something groundbreaking, but what is really crucial is that this equilibrium isn't fixed. It doesn't get to a point where once we know who the biggest superpower is, we can stop, everyone else is subordinated. But the idea that capitalism is driven by accumulation, by greed, by making profit, is constantly shifting this equilibrium. So the foundations in which these empires were building themselves up to be the rulers of the, of the globe are constantly crumbling beneath their feet. And this forces them to not only try to prop themselves up, but to make everyone else around them weak. Such is the logic of the capitalist system, and that is what imperialism was built upon. So um, I'm going to go back a bit to the present today and hopefully give people a bit of a spoiler of where this is going. Uh, people wonder, you know, what the state of things today, are we seeing an end to imperialism? Are we in some sort of stalemate, some fixed form of power, and we're not going to see any changes at all. It is this idea of an even development that just completely demolishes the idea that this is in any way over. Because just as long as the capitalist machine keeps churning and keeps forcing countries and certainly you know, capitalists to compete amongst themselves, you will not always have the same sort of strongest um, in part, if, even if that were a good thing, which is not. Uh, but you will always have this competition that inevitably leads to disastrous consequences. Now, to bring it back to the specific context in which this theory was developed, um, it is really, really important that we argue why it came about and how, after all, this theory sought to explain why we suddenly found ourselves in a different stage of capitalism altogether. And having said that, you know, the two things that I hope people take away from the meeting, I want to take some time to explain what exactly imperialism is. After all, you know, we, we've discussed a lot about what it is not, but let's get into, into what, it, what was happening at the time. So what revolutionaries at the time noted was that capitalism was entering a specific stage in its development in which its very own characteristics were turning into its opposites. And this is you know, a bit of a mouthful, but let's you know, try and deconstruct that and see what we mean. Capitalism, after all, is built on free competition, the free market, accumulation, the idea that you can build yourself from the ground up and suddenly turn into Bill Gates or what have you. Now, if you're in this room, you already know that this isn't happening today, but it wasn't happening back then, and this is a very crucial point in history in which um, what Lenin calls the monopoly stage of capitalism develops, the idea that Firms at the time were getting so large that free competition was essentially being eliminated by the fact that if you have the biggest industry, the biggest company, it's just a matter of time before you swallow up the smaller company that just started to sort of be constructed and they're either going to be part of your larger company or they're going to be made to disappear because you're in such a position of, of overtaking them. Now this is not to say obviously that competition on a global scale was over by any means, but what is really important is that, is very crucially, we're starting to see all these companies, all these monopolies, essentially just become the rulers of a certain sector of the, of the economy. And this is important, and, and we see it today. I mean, when was the last time that, I don't know, you watched the show that wasn't produced by Disney, or had a drink that wasn't owned by Nestle, or Pepsi, or what have you. But it is this contradiction in capitalism in which um, the free competition is displaced by monopolies. That sets the point for what um, Lenin argued was the crucial distinction between imperialism and its previous stage of colonialism. Now, obviously, when we talk about um, what was happening at the time, this wasn't just the case, after all. Uh, monopolies could have just kept to their own borders and could have just not had war whatsoever if that was the only case. So I'm going to give you the five things that he argued made uh, imperialism become a stage of capitalism in itself. We've already gone over number one, so don't worry, this list is not too long after this. 
Uh, so we have the concentration of all the production in these massive monopolies that are already kind of spell disaster because um, they're already being controlled by corporations that couldn't care less about their workers or the people that they're ruling over. Um, however, and this is where it gets worse and it will be, keep getting worse, um, you not only have this massive industrial capital being concentrated, but this is where banks come in and not only do they keep to themselves and do their bidding, but they merge with industrial capital to create an even worse sort of monster, which Lenin called the financial oligarchy. Um, this is very important because the financial oligarchy then becomes identified with the state, and therefore it becomes the interest of the state to protect this financial oligarchy, crucially through becoming militarized. I mean, and it's important to know that in a lot of cases, these were the same people. I mean, after all, if you had a, uh, an arms company, it was a matter of time before you were able to sort of become part of the financial oligarchy and therefore even become part of the of the ruling classes in, in that aspect. I mean, and we see that today. I mean, how many sort of MPs have sons that work for BAA systems or that are um, definitely have stakes in companies uh, that deal with weapons and so on? So you already had sort of a recipe for disaster right there and then, but this wasn't just the end of the story because at this point in history, again, uh, a lot of things were happening for the first time, but it is the idea that you no longer were dealing with commodities across borders, across this massive international competition that now is being waged against monopolies and capital associations, but it's capital itself that now can be moved across borders. And this is really important because it just gives the financial oligarchy even more power to just do as they please. Um, we see this today, for example, when we talk about money, shares, or I, I guess if you're Elon Musk, cryptocurrency, or what have you. Um, so <laughs> that's number two and three of the points I was going to make. Um, now, this is where it goes back to sort of real life. And I stop to talk about shares and eco the economy, and I bring it back to, to land. Um, so point number four and five refer, of, re refer to the world and what was happening at the time. Now, obviously, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail into this because it's not meaning about colonialism, but um, the colonial project at the time uh, was already sort of coming to an end in the sense that um, not that the, the European powers were suddenly becoming kinder or deciding that they were done sort of killing people in the global south, but there was just no more world to take over. Um, they, they had already gone everywhere they could in the globe and essentially ended up sharing a border with themselves. Um, you would have written, I don't know, in Africa, sharing a border with Belgium, and, and there was no more land for them to try and, and colonize. So this is a crucial point that marks the sort of change between colonialism and imperialism. I'm not trying to say here that by any point the, the rhetoric got even better, I'm not saying that they abandoned the racism, it actually got, got worse as a result of that. But what is crucial here is that they were, going, they were getting to a point where the only war they could wage was against themselves. And um, this is precisely what happens when these capitalist associations that I've described, these massive sort of monsters that overtake the banks, the, the industrial capitalists um, have to share the world amongst themselves. There is a new layer of rivalry. We're not just talking about sort of Belgium being the first to um, get to a certain part of the war, or Britain taking over India, it was also the capitalist associations that now found themselves having to compete with each other on a global scale to try and divide the world um, in, in their terms. And as, uh, as I've said before, and certainly as we've seen with examples in real life, there is really only one answer to what happens when you have um, the monetary incentive of taking over the world, but also the, a world that is finite and that you've already carved up, and that is to wage war on each other, especially when you have nation states that are so uh, dedicated to defending the interests of the, of the capitalist um, ruling classes. Now, obviously, it would be an oversimplification to argue that that's all the state does, but certainly at the time, it was really essential that the state was becoming identified with this financial oligarchy. So, as I've said before, we put all of these five features together, we end up in a terrible position in sort of the, the world, and certainly the outbreak of the First World War proved um, the case for this theory and the idea that imperialism is a, is a system that breeds war and breeds destru destruction as it forces these nation states and these capitalist powers to compete against each other on a global scale. So the, the scale of the destruction is really as big as, as the planet.
Now, two key points I want to come back on before I sort of try and bring it back to, to the present and we'll stop talking about the 20th century. The first one of them is that imperialism is not a fixed system. This is in the case where um, you will have a strong power that is slowly bu um, bullying weaker powers and once that one person's won, then we're all done and we're just working for that imperial power at the end of the day. It is important that we know that imperialism it's a system. It is a system of rivalry in which all these countries are interlocked into a rivalry that forces them to compete against each other. A lot of the times using war, using violence, but not just doing that. And it is important that we remember that when we argue that um, can, can states be exempt from, from the system if they want to rule the world more centrally not. Um, the second point I want, to, I want to make here is the concept of how do we apply it to today and is this really is this really relevant and before i get into that can i just take from the start fantastic so you get a lot of examples that's really good <laughs> right um so when we bring it to today we have to note a couple of things that we need to acknowledge when we talk about the marxist theory of imperialism certainly it's not a case of just saying okay we have a checklist of giving you five points give me every country in the world we're just going to tick, 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 and see which ones are the imperialist strong and which ones are not. Um, we need to make some acknowledgements about how this theory applies to today's world, right? And one of the things that I want to talk about when we talk about imperialism is what happened after, after this theory was developed. And I want to talk about three, if you will, points in history um, that exemplify the points I'm trying to make. Um, the first one of them is what I want to argue happened before the Cold War, if, if you will, um, before we were in, in present terms. Um, at the time, you had the all European powers sort of waging war on each other. You had um, two world wars, and essentially, you had a, a world where there were, you know, the all European powers trying to share the war amongst themselves. It is important that we note here that that stage only ended and gave way to a different one because it stopped being profitable to the old European empires. It wasn't a case of saying, you know, uh, we're done, sort of ruling over India. It, it was a, a situation in which it no longer became profitable for the old European powers to sort of try and enforce their empires across the world. And this, underli this idea of profit underlines much of the, of the logic here. And I want people to remember that if they can for the discussion. Now, obviously, uh, then we have to talk about the Cold War and what happened during that time. And essentially, this is where a lot of the confusion um, starts to happen because a lot of people on the left maybe try to, try to explain the Cold War outside of the, uh, sort of the context of inter-imperialist rivalry. Now, I want to argue here that um, what we were seeing at the time was just another example of how imperialism was being sort of um, performed across, across the world. I mean, I want to argue that the Soviet Union at the time could only be understood in the context of, of the the pressure from capitalism, global dynamic on competitive accumulation expressed on the military threat on, on other states. And I want to argue that you know, this model was then emulated in China after the Chinese Revolution of 1949, and certainly uh, well after that. But um, to bring it back to the, to the present, because I think that's what people will be talking about maybe more in the discussion, I want to talk about a world after the Cold War and a world dominated by the US. Um, it is definitely a case where we've gone from a cold war that was a bipolar world to a unipolar world. A lot of people argue um, they, with the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of communism. Are we seeing an end to history? Are we seeing an end to imperialism? Are we seeing a point of, in the world where this theory of imperialism no longer applies because the US has won? Um, and here I want to come back to what I said at the beginning, the, the idea of uneven development. And I hope in, in people's minds, you're starting to see a big, you know, massive no at the idea that this is the end of imperialism and this is the end of sort of this um, rivalries at all. Because it is the idea that this equilibrium isn't fixed. That means that we're not necessarily seeing an end to any of the shifting in the system. Now, it is important to note, obviously, that the US has massive influence over, over the world, and it is currently the, the biggest imperialist, imperialist power. But um, like I said before, imperialism is a system. It's not just about the dominance of one state against another. Um, it is a, a system in which different capitalist states are struggling 
against each other and potentially producing crises that they can't control. And we, we've seen this time and time again with the escalation of nuclear weapons. Certainly we're seeing this today in the case of Ukraine, where if, if it isn't the U.S. threatening to use nuclear weapons, it will be Russia at the time. I mean, uh, for example, if you, if you talk about Ukraine in particular, um, we're seeing here an example, as I've said before, of this inter-imperialist rivalry. I mean, after all, Russia now is trying to sort of grab onto the remnants of the imperialist power it once had, and NATO, which essentially exemplifies the interest of the US, is trying to exert dominance, thank you, over the, um, over the world once again. And what we're seeing here is essentially a proxy war in the sense that, um, don't be fooled that for a second NATO cares any sort of level on the, on the interest of Ukrainian people. What they're trying to do is what they did in Iraq, what they did in Afghanistan. They're trying to exert dominance over a section of the war to say that they're the ones that, were, that, that won, that, that rule over the world, and to try and send a message to anyone that could pose a challenge to that. Um, now, before I run out of time, I feel like I will get a lot of questions about China, so I want to address that as well. Um, when we look, about, when we look at, at China, uh, we have to see how it also inhabits uh, a global system of rivalry and imperialist competition that I think is exemplified through the example of, of Taiwan in particular. Now, if people are not familiar with it, we have seen escalation around the area of Taiwan from both the US and China side trying to compete over um, who gets to say what happens in Taiwan. There has been some dangerous escalation with um, China performing what they call military exercises on a, on a certain part of the ocean that had US vessels and NATO sort of system vessels um, to sort of try and waste that uh, low exercise of power. Now, what this looks like to me is again two imperialist powers trying to decide what happens over a, over a slice of the world that they really have no, no right over it in the sense that it, like they did in, in Iraq, like they did in Afghanistan, you have an imperialist power coming in saying, we are going to decide what happens in this part of the world, and it's up to us about the, uh, like, as the empire to sort of talk about that today. So, like I said before, what, what does the Marxist theory of imperialism have to say about this? Is this even relevant? I want to argue that time and time again, we're seeing examples of this theory happening in today's world, but more significantly, uh, you know, we cannot be delusioned by this idea that the U.S. has won, um, we were going to have peace because no one would dare stand up to the U.S., or that there are some benevolent institutions such as the European Union, for example, that I know that comes up a lot, that have transcended this idea of imperialism, have transcended the idea that now nation states don't want to wage war on each other because they've, they've learned better. And I want to bring it back once again before, before I finish to this idea of uneven development and this idea of profit. Just as long as capitalism goes on, just as long as we're interlocked in this imperialist system that seeks profit, putting the interest of a nation state, the interest of the working class themselves uh, behind the, this idea of accumulation, we're going to be interlocked in this sort of inter-imperialist rivalry that we see in today. So don't think for a second that we're living in a world where the Marxist theory of imperialism is irrelevant. And certainly what I want to finish on is that this theory isn't just an explanation, but it is a key. It's a key to liberation. It's a key to ending all wars. Because as I've explained, imperialism has a very, very um, well-defined basis. It comes from a specific point and it gives a target, right? I've talked about how the ruling class benefits from imperialism, how the ruling class started imperialism to begin with, and that is our target, and that is how we end war. We just not end war by sort of fighting them, but we have to turn all these wars, all these imperialist wars, into class wars on the ruling classes that um, precisely uh, have an interest in them and want to, and want to win them. And I'll just end it on, on this idea, which in, in, the, in our tradition we like to call the idea that the main enemy is at home. So I'll just leave people with the notion that although we are seeing a system of imperialist rivalry today that we can explain with the Marxist theory of imperialism, this doesn't have to be a war forever, and this theory in particular give us a very good example and a very good target of where to strike so we can win. And I'll just leave it there. Great introduction there. So now we're going to just have two to three minutes. If you could just turn to the people you're sat around and we'll just have small discussions in these little 
groups there, and then we'll come back for the main discussion in two to three minutes. So please do have a talk amongst yourselves there. Um, so everyone will be given three minutes to speak. I'll tap the microphone or tap on the table when you have a minute left to speak. I'll be taking con contributions around the room, so please do put, keep putting your hands up uh, as I go around. So as I said, we'll get three minutes uh, for every person, the person in the back there, and then we'll go to the person over there. I think the importance of the, the talk that we've just heard is that it, it identifies imperialism as a system of competing imperialisms rather than, um, you know, one bad guy uh, that needs to, 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 be, to be addressed. Because this is the great temptation, isn't it? We see it around Ukraine that, um, you know, the, the, the argument is either um, we must arm Ukraine against uh, the, the predatory uh, Russian state, uh, or it's uh, where Russia had a, a uh, its interests were violated by NATO and, you know, it's got its right to, 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 to carve up its own state. Because what that formula leaves out is what, what our, our party is all about. It's actually focusing on the working class as their own agency to change. And it can lead you in all sorts of directions if you take this kind of, a, uh, a, you know, view of the world that, you know, I, 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 I remember I was at the World Social Forum in Kenya in 2008. And there was a very, very interesting talk by the great Egyptian uh, uh, Marxist Samir Amin, who was very, very good. And somebody asked him what he thought of China's involvement in, in Africa. And he said, um, he, he welcomed it because he said, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, America have had free reign in Africa. And isn't it great that there is now a counter hegemony to that? What that leaves out is the bloody African people themselves. And this is a constant trap that pe people fall into. And it's something we cannot do as, 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 as Marxists. We have to remind people, because it's not taught in our schools, that the First World War was not stopped by the mighty British army uh, or, or the rest of it. It was stopped by um, Russian people refusing to fight it in 1917. It was stopped by sailors in Kiel refusing to uh, board, the, board uh, ships and going out and fighting for, 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 for their ruling class. This is what we say, and this is why our slogan, neither Washington nor Moscow nor Beijing, if it comes to it, is absolutely necessary today. Very quickly on what the comrade raised uh, on the first question, really, because funny enough, there were two motions for the Lecturers Union Conference, right? One said exactly what he raised about solidarity, etc., etc., with, with, with um, refugees, all those things that everybody voted. What did the second motion say? The second motion says that it calls for Russia to get out, but it also called for NATO to stop trying to escalate the war. And it said the way to deal with the war was for Britain to pump in increasing amount of arms into, into the conflict. Um, it won, by the way, the conference. Right, so around it. And since then, there has been an argument, and rightly there should be a discussion and an argument inside any union about it, right? But it does come back to a basic thing, doesn't it? Right, so at the minute, we have a choice, don't we? Right, so which is, do we think that there is this bad imperialism, right, so which, which is Putin, for some reason, this better version of imperialism, that in some ways wants to help the population of the Ukraine, right, stuff by sending through um, depleted uranium shells. I send him through the use of crews now. I send him through F-16 fighters and the rest of it. In other words, do we think that instead of it being the self-activity of the working class in Ukraine and Russia that can deal with it, right? Stuff that in some ways is in <coughs> Western stuff around here. Yeah. Under that basis, it's a really important goal for the socialists to put up an argument. So what we need now is less war and more peace. What we need now is a, is a ceasefire now and not the next version of heavy weapons going in and stuff. And so I'm really proud. People on the left that argument inside the UCU and stuff around it because, because when it finishes up, seeing stuff, you know, I, mean, I know this is like we, we're talking about historical examples, right? But in 1914, Germany invaded Belgium. People say Belgium has the right to self determination, its right to arm itself, its right to defend itself. But within about 30 minutes, the situation of Belgium was caught up in a massive worldwide inter imperialist conflict. And the problem is, we have to see what the map base is. What's going on inside the Ukraine? And the last thing I'd say about it, I mean, it's right to have this discussion stuff. It's a really complex and real discussion to have. And there's been a massive frown inside the UCU about it. But sometimes socialists have people there to take a minority position. Right, stuff around it. In some ways, I think for a generation of people, we became kind of you know, a bit of a luxury that the bad guy was America. 
Right stuff over Britain, you can see it, stuff over Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. This is a much more complicated political situation for people to deal with and stuff around it. And it means we have to be prepared to start putting anti war arguments, starting to win that as a, as a priority. Commander. I think, last thing of all, one of the reasons why there was a massive fallout from that motion is it's the first time <laughs> in the statement of the Firefighters Union that the union has said. But the answer to the conflict in Ukraine is not more arming by NATO. And let's be clear about what they're saying. They're talking about now all the NATO leadership is talking openly about the fact that Ukraine will enter NATO. And many of them are talking about the fact of what will the world look like when you Please sum up. nuclear weapons. This isn't the answer. The answer is ordinary people challenging war. And that's why the analysis of imperialism does need to lead to practice exactly what you're saying. Sometimes we need to try to argument and try to win. Right, thanks. My name's David. I'm um a member of a sister group of the SWP in Barcelona, and I was also one of the spokespeople of the anti movement in Catalonia uh, around the time of the Iraq war. But I can remember, I lived in Britain at the time of the Malvinas war, and at that time I wasn't a member of anything, but I remember having to take a stand against the Malvinas war, and it was really tough, but you had to take a stand against it. In the Iraq war, it was a lot easier. But even then, it wasn't totally easy. I remember for that massive international protest on the 15th of February in 2003, there were arguments about why was it important to take a stand about the question of the war against US imperialism. There were other people on the left saying, no, let's not talk about the war, let's talk about the foreign debt and the IMF, which are all important issues, but they were not the key issue at the time. And so I think those sort of debates come up even worse way around Ukraine, because the anti-war uh, anti movement in Catalonia still exists, but it's a lot weaker now, like everywhere. The scandalous thing is there are people on the left, people on Supposedly revolutionary left that are basically doing the same as the reformists did in 1914, supporting their own ruling class against another ruling class. It's also horrible, but they're supporting their own ruling class in a war. And I remember when I started, started reading about Marxism about imperialism, I said, How is it possible? This is impossible what the reformists are doing. This is scandalous. And now there are people who call themselves revolutionaries doing the same thing. So I think that's why it's so important, the things that Larry was talking about in the introduction, that if you get lost on the headlines and the scandals, you should be angry about the headlines and the scandals, the bombing of civilians in Ukraine. But if you start from there, you'll get lost, like a lot of the reformists left did in 1914. You have to start by understanding what's happening in the world, that like Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg said, we're against all imperialism, but the main enemy is at home. And if you lose that, then you're lost and you're actually playing the game for the enemies. In the Spanish state, what calls themselves the most progressive government in the history of Spain is now wanting to almost double arms spending to 2% of GDP. What does that mean for health spending, education spending? These are not abstract arguments. These are about which side are we on? Are we on the side of workers internationally or on the side of one or other ruling class? And it's, are we for spending money on people's health and services? And by the way, that's another way of stopping fascism. Or are we in favor of sending more weapons to kill more people around the world? And I think for any socialist, it should be very, very clear. Yeah, comrades, I think that um, I'd, I'd like to thank Laura for her contribution because I think she explained very clearly why we as Marxists argue that imperialism is not just about nasty big nations bullying smaller nations. We argue that imperialism is part of a system and every country, every capitalist country is caught within that system. And that's why the United States, uh, funnily enough, and it is funny, are talking about democracy in the Ukraine, <laughs> uh, but totally ignore the need for democracy in the Yemen, for instance, why they are quite happy to back filthy, awful dictators in the Middle East, because they, uh, they and also why they're happy to back Israel in the Middle East as their policemen on the ground. And I think that what we argue from the Socialist Workers' Party in answer to the excellent contribution from the comrade here is to say that because it's a system, what is driving America? And America doesn't give a damn about the Ukraine. What America is interesting is sending a calling card to China. In other words, we will do 
to you in China or in Taiwan what we are doing to you in the Ukraine today. Be warned. That's what the real argument is. And you see, comrades, if you look at the Ukraine, it terrifies me because already 300,000 people have died, probably more. People aren't in, entirely clear. And how much longer has that got to go on like that? And I think Sheila is quite right when she refers to Brigozzi, because that shows that in Russia, it's unstable. <laughs> and there will be Russian mothers, Russian families who will be mourning the deaths of their sons and their daughters who have been slaughtered on the battlefields of Ukraine. They will be saying, why can't we have decent health care in Russia, but we spend money on war? And in this country, we have Sunak, who refuses to support the renters, the mortgage crisis, the cost of living crisis, and so on, and the COVID crisis. He refuses to spend money on any of those things, and yet we're pouring money into the killing fields of the Ukraine. And so when we talk about an anti-war movement emerging, we're not just talking Please about stop. Russia, we're talking about the uh, United Kingdom, where there is a growing anger, a growing frustration inside the US, in Chicago, South Side, on the Bronx, in the Bronx, and so on. Are people happy that America's spending millions, trillions of dollars on death and destruction and not providing an elementary health care. And I think we have to have confidence in our history. One final point. There is a book, The, the uh, Sleepwalkers of 1940. Uh, Please sum up, before. comrade. Finished up. Okay, I'll finish. Thank you for that last contribution there and finish it perfectly at quarter two. I will now bring Laura back on to her. Great. Well, thank you, comrades, for our fantastic discussion. I want to start by saying that, obviously, I appreciate the very impassioned contributions because I think everyone in this room is a very <coughs> much is a, is a stake at the minute. So um, if you didn't get to sort of come, contribute, come speak to me at the end. Or, you know, luckily for you, the, the weekend's just started. So there'll be sessions specifically on Ukraine, on, on different uh, things that have been mentioned. So um, there, there'll be a chance to discuss that. But definitely, let, let's talk about anyone that didn't get to to contribute. Um, so I wanted to start by, by saying what, what I've just opened with. There is a lot at stake and it's understandable that people want to discuss not just the theory but how it applies to practice today. So I'm going to try and address sort of the points that were raised in a, in a sort of long together sort of way but if there's anything that I've missed again um, we have I think a half hour break or, or longer now so let, let's chat about it uh, and then. So um, I wanted to start uh, by using the question that someone asked on how the theory can guide the practice. And this is where I think it gets confusing, because when there's a lot of stake, we certainly have nuclear weapons on the table, we're seeing mass destruction on a large scale, we're seeing people die on the battlefield. It is understandable that our first reaction is to want to put an end to that, and to sort of say, okay, well, let's take whatever is like the lesser of two evils, if that thing is even uh, possible and just uh, reevaluate once we we come to that. Now, luckily, we have history to draw from to see whether or not this would be a good idea. And in general, history seems to suggest that conceding to one imperialist power really ends well for the people that this imperialist uh, war has affected in the first place. I mean, um, I was reminded uh, another time I did this meeting, someone raised the, raised the quote. Um, that a revolutionary in Iraq used about Saddam Hussein saying that yes, he's a bastard, but he was our bastard. And he was asked to deal with, and it was up to the sort of Iraqi rule, um, working class to get rid of him without the, the intervention of certainly not the US or anything that, that happened after that. So we have to start from the position that the working class in each one of these countries is perfectly capable of getting rid of their own ruling class without the intervention of that, you know, it never happens, but at best, benevolent intervention of any imperialist power, essentially, not the US. So, when we talk about what is happening in Ukraine, which has been mentioned a lot, um, and as one comrade has suggested, the media has had a lot to play in sort of suggesting that there is a lesser of two evils, that there is a, 
a way to end this conflict in which we win the war and, and the killing ends. Now I want to sort of draw people's attention to another example of a conflict that is not comparing them in any way, but it is an example of the destruction that inter-imperialist rivalry can wage in a country once we strip away the moral justification that the media is trying to give us. And I want to highlight what is happening in Sudan at the moment, because um, we have seen something not exactly quite similar, but in, in the purpose of this comparison, uh, we're still seeing the two generals that have staged a, a coup in, in Sudan overturning the massive gains of the Sudanese revolution and have effectively started a civil war. They're both being backed respectively by Russia and the US. Now we don't have the rhetoric of the media to tell us in this case, certainly they, they forgot about Sudan once all the British sort of ambassadors were safely back in in Britain because they, they don't care about the Sudanese people themselves. But the, here we can see an example of the destruction and the wreckage that this inter-imperialist rivalry is waging on a country that, was, that had lived through a revolution and where we were starting to see the results of workers' powers come to fruition. We had neighborhood communities being established. We had um, people organizing themselves to sort of take on the ruling classes. And, by this imperialist powers getting involved and backing this, these generals that don't want anything um, to, to help the country, they're essentially undermining the success of ruling class people themselves. Now that is obviously not the full complexity of what is happening in Sudan, and this brings me on to my second point, which I hope I have time to make, which is the idea that working class people are able to put an end to war in their own country by themselves without the intervention of imperialist powers. And this is where we have to go back to sort of the, the bare bones of the imperialist theory and look at where it started and talk about the ruling class and not necessarily sort of the, the matters at hand. We cannot get lost in the rhetoric of is the US worse than, than Russia? Are they a worse empire? Or is Russia going to help in any way or another? At the core of it, it is working class people fighting wars for the ruling class. And that is what war has been ever since it was, it was sort of conceived. And we have to be very clear in the idea that, winning, that the way to win wars is not to win them all, right? It's the idea that we have history to draw back from, from successful examples in which working class people have realized that at the end of the day, what underlies uh, imperialism or underlies war is, is the system itself and to get rid of war you have to go after the entire system that creates war which is capitalism and I want to bring it back to the example of Russia in 1917 in the context of the First World War to sort of illustrate what I mean when I say that um, obviously it seems really difficult to sort of end the war again from your own side. What do we do if the I don't know the Ukrainian army refused to fight? Is that is that gonna put an end to war? And what I want to talk about is what happened in Russia in 1917 as an example of why we have so much faith in the Russian anti-war movement and the and the Ukrainian anti-war movement. Because they they won't tell you, you know, this in history class when they're trying to big up the, the British Empire and, and what happened as a result of that. But the First World War suffered a massive blow in terms of, of the case for, for fighting it when the Russian army at the time realized that they were waging a war as the working class that was in the interest of their own ruling class. There was an imperialist war that wasn't benefiting anyone but the ruling classes of their own country. And this is what I think is incredibly relevant to today because we're still seeing Russian people, Ukrainian people, uh, dying on the front lines for a war that is not theirs. Now, um, this isn't something that is just a case of saying, well, you know, we have the moral high ground, we are the ones that have realized that uh, empire is bad, so now we all die, at least we have, the, our conscience is clear. What they did in Russia in 1917 is turn around and wage war on their own ruling class and effectively target the root of the system that was creating the war in the first place. And what ensued after that was not you know, the overthrowing of imperialism and the end of an imperialist war, but we saw a successful revolution that targeted the very system that created the war in the first place, which was capitalism. So in Russia in 1917, the army turned around, went home, and decided that they were done with the ruling classes. And, you know, it wasn't the only stage in, in the Russian revolution. I'm not, certainly not suggesting that. But it was that awareness that the war was never going to benefit them 
that forced them to turn their weapons metaphorically and maybe, maybe, I'm not condoning that, but the, physically on, on their own ruling classes. Um, so I want to argue here, with a, with a few time that I have left, that that is the key to sort of seeing an end to war. Because we forget when we talk about imperialism and we talk about inter-imperialist rule, <coughs> that at the end of the day, there is nothing these imperialist powers won't do to defend the very system that is benefiting them constantly. I mean, we haven't talked about China in particular, but we can't forget how even though there's this rivalry between the US and China today, what happened in 2008, for example, when there was a massive economic crash that sort of put the capitalist system in a, in a difficult position, it was the stimulus that came from the Chinese economy that swept in to say global capitalism. So when it comes down to defending the system, it is the one time these imperialist powers won't argue with each other and won't be at war. And we have to be absolutely clear on the fact that if we want to see an end to war, we have to realize that war itself is a product of capitalism, imperialism is a product of capitalism, and draw from the lessons of the past to realize that if we want to see an end to war, what we need to have is an end to capitalism. And I just want to end it there because I think when we talk about imperialism and today, what do we want to see? We obviously don't, well, we want to see an end to the wars that are currently being waged at the minute, but we don't just want to see that we want all war to disappear. And as long as there exists a justification for war in the sense of profit, as long as war remains profitable and empire remains profitable, we'll still be seeing all of that. Now obviously this didn't just come out of thin air in the sense of the, um, the Russian army in 1917 wasn't just saying, well, um, I just watched my best friend die, uh, this is terrible, I want to go get rid of capitalism. It took organization and it took arguing within the working class, not just in the army, but in Russia itself, um, to realize that they could overthrow the entire system. And I want to make a strong case here for organizing the working class as a tool drawing you know, from the lessons from the Marxist theory of imperialism, what people have highlighted are appalling examples of imperialism across the world, what underlies all of that is that they can't convince working class people uh, to fight a war that is not in their interest when they're organized. And people in Sudan today understand that. Um, the revolutionary committees in Sudan have not gone away. They're still refusing to take sides in this war because they understand the civil war is not benefiting the working class as a whole. And people in Russia in 1917 certainly understood that it took organization and it took people like the Bolshevik party to argue that war was in the interest of the working class. So I just want to make a strong case here for everyone in this room that is passionate about this topic and sort of cares about, uh, about the war as we, as we all do, to get organized. Because the rhetoric that's coming from the media is really strong. Um, there's a world at stake and we certainly have a war to win, but only when we fight together. So anyone that's here that wants to get organized, I would encourage everyone to join the Socialist Workers' Party and let's fight together to end the war and imperialism.